Today we're gonna to talk about Brene Brown. I'm a big fan of hers and she has many killer quotes. But one of my favorite quotes talks about how you should think about the people that you truly dislike. This is a tough one and I'm, but, and some of us don't realize that it's part of number one, emotional intelligence or EQ. And number two, that it's actually part of our success. Sometimes when I coach people or when I'm guiding people or when I do a keynote and I talk to people, there's an assumption that when you get to a certain level of success, you have your bestseller, you become a millionaire, whatever that metric is um, that's accepted by society, the assumption is that you don't have to deal with people that you don't like. And it's actually quite the opposite. I've worked with hundreds if not thousands of, of independents, the creators, the natural entrepreneurs I talk about, and everyone's in a different place. And I'm not gonna be everyone's cup of tea, as my mother would say. And you have to find a way to work with people sometimes that don't quite understand where you're coming from. I did an ink column uh, over at inkdamonbrown.com. Check it out. I have 500 plus columns as we speak. So feel free to go over to inkdamonbrown.com and I talk about this. And there's one particular quote that, that I wanna share with y'all. She says, the most compassionate people assume that other people are doing the best they can. I live the opposite way. I assume that people weren't doing their best so I judged them and constantly fought being disappointed. I judged them and constantly fought being disappointed. How does that resonate? I know it hit me a little bit. Um, and I think it comes down to one simple question. When you're having a difficult time with someone, business-wise or even personally, I think you need to ask yourself, do you believe this person is doing the very best that they can? Do you believe this person is doing the very best that they can? They could be a knucklehead. They could be <laughs> many other things that, that would probably get censored if I said them. But I mean, are they doing the best that they can? I think about a Les Brown uh, keynote that I saw a little while ago where he talked about how long it takes to start something. And it's hard because you don't know what you're doing, you know? And he says, you know, when a baby's trying to, to walk, and they fall out for the first time, the guardians of the parents don't say, oh, he's not a walker. He's not meant to do this. She, she's not cut out for this. She needs to go to crawl for the rest of her life. Of course not. I have two kids. Like, you don't do that. <laughs> even, if you're like, even, even if you're like the meanest, meanest guardian in the world, you would never do that. No, you'd say, oh, okay, this is the process. Let's trust the process. What if we apply that empathy, that um, thoughtfulness, that sensitivity, to all of our relationships and made a decision and said, okay, I think this person's not doing their best, so I need to have a conversation with them. That's one thing. But what Brene Brown's talking about, which is probably more often the case, is that they actually are doing their best. They're just not doing their best based on how we would do it. So of course we can't judge how we would walk or run down the street compared to say an 18 month old kid, a toddler. So applying that actually gives us a level of sensitivity. It also makes us think, and, and again, back to the empathy, think about what it's like in that person's shoes. I know I've had business partnerships. I've done 25 books. Um, a third of them have been co-authorships. Co uh, some of them did really well. Some of them were really rough rides. And one of the biggest lessons I learned from that, as well as my um, startup cuddler, which I sold, I had two co-founders and you know, relationships are complicated. And if you get empathetic and start to think about what the other person's shoes must feel like, then suddenly you start to soften up and that judgment starts to go away. And Brene Brown gets into that. I believe it's in Rising Strong that she talks about that. Um, in her book, Rising Strong, I highly recommend it. What she talks about how when you judge other people, then you're also judging yourself. And so if you're saying, oh, that person's so stupid, I can't believe they can't get it together and all that stuff. The next time you're having a difficult time, which I've seen in live action, you could be talking about someone else and then suddenly you're in that same situation and that's actually reflective of your own self-dialogue. How you feel about yourself if, you be in that, if you're in that same situation. When we spew toxic things or when we're very uh, judgmental of other people, that's often a reflection of how and what standard we have for ourselves. The trouble is, is that life is complicated. And again, I've lived long enough to see it where someone's talking about someone else and then suddenly they're in that same situation and their psyche can't handle it. 
But that's because that harshness, that harshness is too heavy and they're too judgmental of other people, but also very judgmental of themselves. So as we soften up this idea, and once we're about to lose our cool, which happens to me all the time, so it's not, I'm not judging you. If we're about to lose our cool, asking ourselves, do we believe this person's doing the very best that they can? If it's a yes, yeah, let, let that shit go. When you're failing, and if we're doing great stuff, we're gonna fail all the time. Here's what she says. Shame is a focus on self, while guilt is a focus on behavior. It's not just semantics. There's a huge difference between I screwed up, guilt, and I am a screw up, shame. The former is acceptance of our imperfect humanity. The latter is basically an indictment of our very existence. I failed many times. I even failed this past week. <clears throat> this is part of the journey, uh, but I also have a lot of accomplishments under my belt. They come hand in hand. If you're not failing regularly, as one person said, then you might be playing it a little bit too safe. I think there's two really big things we can get from this. The first thing is that failure is naturally a part of success. If you're not failing, then the chance of you being successful aren't that high. I recently did a show about Kevin Hart. He's the number one comedian in the world, making hundreds of millions of dollars, not exaggerating, in his concerts, merchandise, movies, all that stuff. But like 15, 20 years ago, his main movie, the first movie that he was in called Soul Plane, actually was bootlegged like crazy to the point where I'm not even sure if they made money on it. But that bootlegging, which was a failure, actually exposed him to way more audiences. And when he got back on the club circuit, because he was doing stand-up, when he got back on the circuit, suddenly he could raise his price up. That led him 15, 20 years later to where he is today, where again, he's the number one comedian in the world. So that failure of his movie not doing that well because it was bootlegged so much actually turned into success. Now, if he had too much shame about that happening, then he wouldn't have went back on the road. He would say, you know, I did my first movie, it was a failure, I'm gonna go hide somewhere. He might have had guilt about the way it turned out, but he did not have shame as far as I know. Or at least if he did have shame, it didn't stop him from doing it. Another good example is Steve Jobs. Classic example, I met him many, many years ago. I lived in Silicon Valley, just very briefly. His legendary story is that he started Apple with uh, two other folks. One of the folks ended up bailing out early, unfortunately. The other person was another Steve named Steve Wozniak. They created Apple, the stuff that we're using today. I'm recording on an Apple. I have an Apple laptop there. It's, it's, it's uh, ubiquitous at this point. But back in 83, 84, he got kicked out of his own company. The board kicked him out. Now the Apple brand started to suffer because they were diversifying too much. That's old enough for the other discussion. There's some great books on that, including Becoming Steve Jobs, which I'd highly recommend that book. And then they end up asking him to come back later because they realized he needed his leadership. However, number one, he was humble enough to come back, right? And he, he didn't seem like the much, most humble guy from the interactions I've had with him. And of course, getting to know him a little bit from the stuff he's doing in Silicon Valley. So number one, not the most humble guy, but he was humble enough to come back. So evidently his ego was able to be worked out in that level. Number two, while he was in those proverbial 13 years in the desert, he was actually learning. And so that failure, what got him kicked out, when he came back, he became an even stronger leader up until his death uh, about 10 years ago. But for those 15 years that he came back to the company and was alive, he brought the iPhone, iPad, the iMac, all the things that we consider innovation now came from him failing in the beginning. He got kicked out of his own company. I've done two startups. Second, second one I co-founded. I can't even imagine the pain and the challenge with that. But he had to get over that shame as far as getting kicked out of his own company and realize that that was part of the process. He might have felt guilty about those issues, but shame is a little bit different where you're not willing to show up because you're worried about what other people think. In my own case, I booked the Bite Size Entrepreneur. This is the Ultimate Bite Size Entrepreneur, which is a compilation. But the original book was a tiny book. It came out um, come on the five-year anniversary. So pretty cool. But it came out about five years ago, four and a half years ago now. And when I first was working in the publishing industry, to talk about my main thing, as I said at the top, non-traditional entrepreneurs, the side hustlers, the solopreneurs, all these different folks, the traditional publishing industry wasn't hearing it. They didn't believe that you existed. And even though I existed at the time, I'd already sold my company while being a stay-at-home dad and taking care of my little ones. They still didn't believe that we existed. We were like unicorns. This is like, again, five, six years ago. So that was a failure. 
And I had already done 17 books at that point. The publishing industry in, the New in New York, as well as on the West Coast over here, because I'm based in Vegas, West Coast wasn't trying to hear it either. So what happened? I believed in the vision. I took that failure. And within six to eight weeks, I learned how to self-publish. I created my own publishing imprint. This one became a top 10 bestseller on Amazon. I was up there with Simon Sinek, uh, Chris Gillenbaugh was up there with them from a self-published book. But without that failure, then I wouldn't have the, the thriving publishing imprint I have now. Now I have seven books under my belt and, um, from my own imprint, including a new one built from now. This would not exist without my failure in the traditional publishing industry, which I'd already done 17 books with the traditional publishing industry, and they were not trying to have me do the 18th. So I had to come up with my own path. But if I was stuck in shame about failing, then we wouldn't be speaking right now. These books wouldn't exist. Y'all, again, made the original Bite Size Entrepreneur a bestseller. You supported all the other books since then, including a new one built from now. I thank you for that. Those books would not exist if I was stuck in shame rather than feeling guilty that I wasn't able to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish initially. Because so many people that I coach get confused and think that success is just you having runaway hits. That's not how it works. It's not how it ever works. The second thing is that even if you feel shame, and shame has to do with what other people think of you, and we can break that down even more. Even if you do that, shame isn't going to get you success. As, as they used to say, you can't get there from here. Guilt is judging yourself based on what you think you should do, based on your internal ethics. I talk about that a lot more in my popular TED talk called uh, You Should Strive for Good Enough. I'll throw a link in here. But I talk about that. Guilt is you judging yourself because you have a higher standard. I could have done better with that. Shame is the fear, not actual judging, but the fear of being judged by other people and feeling like you're not good enough. Guilt is an internal metric. Shame is what other, what, 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 how you think people are perceiving you. So shame might not even have to do with your actions, but how you think other people are gonna judge you. Those are two very different areas. One is an internal metric. If you have a certain standard and you do not meet it, it's okay to feel guilty about that, right? I was gonna eat better today. I did, I feel guilty about it. That's one thing. I didn't eat well today. I feel shame about it, so I'm not gonna show up. I'm gonna worry about what other people are saying. That feels totally different, right? You can feel it in your chest versus your heart or your stomach. It's a different type of energy. One of the things that I found as a coach, and I've been talking to a lot of my clients about this too, is that sometimes they'll be stuck, which of course, if you have a coach, sometimes that's why you get a coach, where you're like, I'm not sure how I'm gonna get around this. I don't know how to get motivated. I don't know how to move forward. I'll talk about that a lot in the book, Build From Now, but sometimes you need a little bit deeper stuff. So you get a coach. I've been talking a lot with my clients who are trying to move forward, but they're procrastinating or their resources aren't together. Or they don't have their systems together. Again, as I talk about in Build From Now, and sometimes the reason that they're stuck is that they're trying to shame themselves into moving forward. I'm gonna feel so ashamed <laughs> that I'm not gonna accomplish this project. I'm gonna feel so ashamed that I'm not gonna get through this massive to-do list. I'm gonna feel so ashamed if my startup doesn't get funding by the end of this year, that I'm going to shame myself into productivity. You can't. Again, you can't get there from here. And that's how shame can kind of seep into our thing. I don't have a whole lot of shame, so that's not really the energy of mine. But I found that sometimes when I want to get things done, I feel a sense of shame and that ends up pushing me forward to get things done. That's really toxic. And it's not something that's sustainable. And a lot of folks that I know that are struggling with their productivity or they're procrastinating too much is because they're coming from a sense of shame. Remember, shame has to do with the outside world. And so once you enter, once you start bringing in the outside world and what you think they're going to say, capital T, as I say in my TED talk, what they are going to say as soon as you get into that mindset, then suddenly all these other things start to unravel and suddenly you start to do things because of the optics, as we say nowadays. So this person is going to think that I'm doing great. So I better post this on social media. I don't want this person to think that I'm slacking off. So I'm gonna do a bunch of busy work, even though I'm not getting anything done and it'll be better off strategizing versus just focusing on the computer. Suddenly, all these things start to seep in. We wanna avoid that. And one of the best ways to avoid that is to realize that shame isn't going to get us there. It's not gonna, it's not gonna make us more productive. 
It's not gonna make us our stuff more fruitful. And it's definitely not gonna give us success. The main thing shame does is actually quieting our inner voice because we're so worried about what other people are going to say. So if you're thinking about how you can feel well, feel, feel well, feel well, and fail well, suddenly the Jersey accent's coming out. <laughs> if you're worried of, or if you're trying to find ways to fail well, number one, you have to understand that failure is a part of success. If you wanna reach success, you gotta fail. I'm failing as we speak. That's part of the process. You can't get there from there. Number two, shame won't get you there. Shaming yourself into being productive or doing well, it doesn't work. I've coached hundreds of clients. I've gone on my own journeys. I've talked to a lot of great mentors who have done way more than I have. There's never been a case where someone shamed themselves into doing great work, especially positive work that's nourishing the world. It's a lot easier for us to make impact in the world. All right, let's get into it. One of my favorite things that Brene Brown has ever said is that she was nervous about how she was gonna show up. If you're not familiar with her, she has best-selling books. Again, she talks about emotional intelligence. She's down in Texas, I believe at the University of Austin, as well as with, with other organizations down there, trying to help us deal with shame, guilt, hidden feelings, processing those things. I am a coach, I have a private coaching practice, and I also work with a lot of nonprofits. And a lot of the folks that I work with are trying to deal with shame because we want to show up in a certain way, particularly with entrepreneurs, which is my specialty. We want to have this creative spark, and, or we have a creative spark, and we want to make an impact in a certain way. But if it's creative, that means that you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea. So self-acceptance is a really big part of the work that I do. And obviously that resonates a lot as far as with um, the work that Brene Brown does and why she's so important to the work that I do. So <laughs> she ended up having this TED talk. It went viral big time. She did a TEDx talk down south, again, down in Texas. And I think within like a month, it had a million views. It was one of the first, I wanna say in 2013, 2012, probably earlier than that. It was one of the first major viral TED videos. I'm sure it's in the millions of millions by this point. And she was feeling a way about it because she was feeling insecure, understandably, because there's a lot of vitriol that was happening online. It's a lot of people that are criticizing her about her appearance and how she talked. And, you know, if you have any type of online presence or any type of presence in person, you know, because I do a lot of talks in person, particularly pre-pandemic, you're going to get criticism. <coughs> Excuse me. You're going to get criticism as far as the work that you do. She has a really simple hack for that. I hate the word hack, but it, it applies to this. She has a small piece of paper like this. <laughs> We're doing it live. <laughs> I wasn't planning this. Small piece of paper. And on it, she writes down five people's names. And then she folds it up. And she puts it in her back pocket. When she's on stage, when she's presenting, and she's feeling insecure. She says, the five people on this list are the five people she gives a shit about when it comes to their opinion. If they're not on this list, then their opinion doesn't matter. A simple, powerful thing to do. Whether you're a public speaker, you're talking to investors um, to potentially invest in your company, you're talking to customers, who may or may not be the people that you're targeting, but they might be interested in your product. Whatever the case may be, it could be even you talking to your family and a certain family members that <laughs> you love them, but their opinion doesn't matter as much. This culls everything down. It culls everything down, and therefore it calms everything down. This is such an important hack for a couple of different reasons. Number one, when you worry about everyone, then you worry about no one. No one is your priority, and it reflects a lack of trust. I have a mentor and friend who came to me a few years ago. I was having a tough time with some presenting I was doing. It was actually a talk. And they pulled me aside, and they were like, you seem to be hesitant in your speaking. And I was like, you know what? I don't know if the audience is going gonna, is gonna to roll with me. I'm going into different <laughs> uncharted territory. If you're familiar with any of my books, you'll see a progression as far as the stuff I talk about and it gets deeper and I might take left turns and right turns with, I've done uh, eight books in the past five and a half years. You can check them out at damonbrown.net or at your favorite bookstore. 
and each of those books, I'm taking the audience, you, on a different part of the journey. So sometimes it's nerve wracking because I'm not doing the same thing over and over again. Same thing with this YouTube channel, which I've had uh, for about a year and a half now. This is completely different than anything else that I've done. So she pulled me aside and she was like, listen, if you don't trust the audience, then the audience isn't going to trust you. If you don't trust the audience, the audience isn't going to trust you. In other words, they're picking up on how I feel insecure, how I'm nervous about how I really need all of their acceptance, every single one of them. It's like being a comedian and having one heckler just throw off your night. The heckler probably doesn't even care about your set. He's probably enjoying a drink or whatever. <laughs> he's probably he's probably gonna forget about it, but he stays with you. If you focus on those five people that matter the most to you, for me, it'll be my partner, my wife, it will be my two kids, it will be my mom, it will be a couple of really close friends, more than five, but you hear where I'm going. If they're like, yo, you're out of line, I'm like, wow, okay, I need to do better. But if somebody else says that, so it reflects, if you're not following that idea, it reflects a lack of trust in your audience. If you have these five people and their opinion matters the most, then it gives validity and weight to what you're trying to do. And also in picking these five people, this is really important, make sure that they're people that love you, that care about you, that want to see you shine, the people that know your desires and your dreams and want to see you succeed. I talk about this in, uh, in uh, my books, um, particularly I think I talk about this in, I wanna say the ultimate bites of an entrepreneur, I've talked about it on the channel quite a few times. You can check out the playlist where I talk about having um, a um, think tank or a um, <laughs> brain trust. <laughs> right, I had a brain fart while I was trying to remember brain trust. <laughs> a brain trust. And these are people that love you, respect you, know your dreams, and want to see you succeed. They should be on your five. The clown that's in the audience that's in the cheap seats, don't worry about what they're saying. But once you start to worry about what everyone's saying, it starts to reflect a lack of trust in the audience itself. And if you're making good stuff for those people that you care about, for that audience, that part of the audience, that minimal viable audience, as Seth Godin talks about, that slice that really cares about the work that you do, <clears throat> then you're able to make a much bigger impact. And the people that get it outside of that range, get it. People that don't, don't. I've done four TED Talks. I just released my 26th book called Career Remix. Get the gig you want based on the skills you've got. Not everybody likes my stuff. In fact, if you look online, I got some pretty, pretty bad reviews. Some of them when I was just starting out. But the book wasn't for them. That TED Talk wasn't for them. For the people that it's for, they'll pull me aside and be like, yo, that TED Talk, that talk to me. That's an extension of this five. I'm really working for them. So number one, if you're worried about people beyond these five, beyond your minimal viable audience, then it reflects a lack of trust in the audience actually going where you're actually going to be going. And if you don't trust the audience to go with you, then you're not really leading. Second of all, if you go beyond this, then it allows you to get distracted from your purpose. Why are you doing what you're doing? Personally, I'm trying to help you as a side hustle or a solopreneur, a non-traditional entrepreneur. If you're not on that path, then it's not for you. This has been the energy for years at this point. <laughs> More years than I like to admit. You see the gray hair starting to come in. <laughs> but because of that, I'm able to go deep with y'all. Y'all that are enrolling in the journey, as Seth Godin also says, those of you that are enrolling in the journey, I don't have to say, go buy my book. I'm gonna say, you're gonna do this, or I'm gonna change my style because you don't like it. If you're rolling with me, you're rolling with me. That's back again to this five. It allows you to go deep rather than wide. And when you go deep, then people are going to see you. They are gonna recognize you. They're going to, uh, what Nil for Merchant calls signaling. It's going to be a signal that you represent a certain culture, a certain tribe, a certain community. And in doing that, 
they're going to enroll to follow you, to work with you. But if you're trying to please everyone, then you're going to please a no one, particularly yourself. Luckily, I learned this early on when I was trying to do things that were killing certain people or I get tough feedback. I try to change up the, the style. But the people that, I, that really wanted to roll with me, the people that I was really trying to impact, they liked the stuff that I was doing. That's all that matters. And that becomes a foundation. And I'm going to tell you what, as I've talked about in previous episodes of the show, as you get more prominent, you start to get known for certain things. If you're not genuine to what you really care about and impacting the right audience, then the money is going to start coming in. The fame is going to start coming in. The notoriety and the ego is going to start getting involved. And if it's not the direction you want to go in and you're trying to please everyone, then you're going to be stuck because then it becomes a lot harder to let go of that money, let go of that fame, let go of the ego and the attention and identity when you have so much on. So do it now. If you're starting your business, figure out your five. This becomes a foundation for your entire career. The difference is with us looking back at something that we went through, something that was a really big hardship in our life. And then when we look back on it, particularly when we're talking to other people, we romanticize it in a way where it wasn't that hard. For instance, I had a colleague who was talking to uh, someone who they were coaching and the person who they're coaching was saying, oh my gosh, I'm having such a hard time. I'm struggling with fear, I'm struggling with challenges and all these things. And my colleague said, well, I actually don't worry about fear. I don't worry about that stuff because I'm beyond that. How does that make you feel? <laughs> it did not make me feel good. <laughs> and luckily there was some commentary from other folks that helped point out how the coach was in the wrong. In other words, the coach was saying, I'm better than you. There's more insight that I have than you have. And therefore, I don't have the same feelings that you have. It was not from a level of empathy or sympathy. But unfortunately, we go through this gold plated grit every single day. We have instances where we go through a tough time and we're like, yeah, I got through it. Why don't you get through it? But the person might be in the middle of the muck. They might be going through some challenging times. They might not have the same resources or frankly strengths that you do. And you might have forgotten some of the struggles that you had at the time. So this gold plated grit can be really dangerous when it comes to what um, Brene Brown specializes in, which is emotional intelligence. And it could hurt your relationships, whether it's your business relationships, your personal relationships, your intimacy, all these different things. So we're gonna break down two reasons why you wanna try to avoid this gold plated grit. The first problem with gold plated grit is that it doesn't actually give room for growth. And the only thing it really brings is a sense of shame. If you're romanticizing a particular struggle that you went through and you're trying to support, quote unquote, someone else, and you're saying it's not that hard, get over it, that person might be in the middle of an emotional crisis. In fact, they might be coming to you for that kind of support, especially if they know that you've gone through it. I was going through a hard time and there was a family member who was, I confided and said, hey, it's having a really tough time. And they said, hey, I've been through that before too. The best thing you can do is get over it and move on. <laughs> the best thing you can do is get over it and move on. I've coached hundreds of people, and now when I think about that moment, I cringe. But I was cringing also at that time too, even though I didn't have some of the wisdom that I have now from working with different people such as yourself. That invalidates someone else's feelings. Now I'm positive that my relative believed that they were helping me be strong and move on but that has to do with their processing. And they might've been struggling at the time when they were having that same challenge that I was having at the time. But there was no sense of empathy. Empathy is you stepping into someone else's shoes and respecting whatever they might be feeling at the moment, even if you'd have a different reaction. That's what empathy is. Sympathy is when you've gone through the same thing and you can relate to what the other person's going through. In the case of this, it was both. They could relate to what I was going through and they could step in my shoes and be empathetic about it as well. But they chose not to. Secondly, when it comes to gold-plated grit, you end up becoming a prison. You, who are doing the judging, you end up becoming a prison to whatever area you're not willing to face. For instance, if you're saying that you went through a divorce or you went through uh, a death 
or you went through some serious financial stuff. All these things that are kind of part of life as you become an adult. The breakups and financial ups and downs and all those things that happen. If you went through that and you look back at it and you romanticize it, you're not actually extracting the lessons that come from it. I think about the painful stuff that I talk about, particularly in my book, uh, Bring Your Worth, which is actually included in the new book, Built From Now, the deluxe edition of that. But the original one is um, Bring Your Worth, Level Up Your Creative Power, Value, and Service to the World. It's still available, but you can get it in the deluxe edition of Built From Now. It's included in there. Thanks for all of y'all who have supported the new book. As I talk about in, in, in Bring Your Worth, I talk about these challenges that I had financially, emotionally, some of the losses that I had. It's a very vulnerable book for me. If I wasn't willing to admit that I lost footing sometimes, that I had challenges, that despite me having a master's in magazine publishing and doing four TED Talks and having best-selling books and having a wonderful family, that I still have all these challenges and all this darkness that I'm having to process. If I wasn't willing to have that conversation, at least in my case, this book wouldn't exist. Definitely built from now wouldn't exist either the new book. Those discussions allowed me to connect with you. But most importantly, which is what I'm getting at, even if you're not a coach, even if you're not an author, even if you're not a TED speaker, it doesn't matter. You have to have that relationship with yourself. You have to have that relationship with yourself. As I mentioned in the first point, as far as judging other people, when we have gold-plated grit, we're actually judging ourselves. I was talking to a colleague recently, and we're talking about partnerships. And I've had a lot of partnerships that haven't worked out that well. I've actually done a video about it recently, about um, how to co-found things and what kind of co-author or co-agreements. Uh, um, co There's so many co's. Co-founderships, co-authorships, which I've done. It's about some of the books over here that you can see. Uh, business partnerships behind the scenes. So a lot of the passive income that I have, it's actually with some of my friends, some of my colleagues and other folks who I've done a partnership with and we end up splitting the profits, etc. cetera. I've done a recent video about this and where I go a lot deeper. But when I was talking to my colleague about partnerships that have quote unquote failed or didn't go the way that we wanted to, what we talked about is how we have to get our part in the role. We have to understand our part in it. There is a level of shame and with Brene Brown, she defines guilt as you having an internal metric. As I talk about in my TED talk, um, the why you should strive to do good enough, which I'll throw a link into here too, back in 2018 over at TEDx Toledo. Guilt is about having an internal metric where you feel as though you should do something, but you're not. You feel guilty about it. Shame has to do with how you believe other people are judging you. Not how they're actually judging you, but how you believe they're judging you. Imagine that, but that has to do with your relationship with yourself. So if you have a partnership that goes sour, that goes the wrong way, that goes in the direction that you don't feel good about, you might feel guilt about the decisions that you made with it, but shame has to do with how other people will judge you. If you're pointing at other people and saying, this partnership went sour, they did something wrong. You're not taking ownership of your part your part is that you chose them as a partner. Your part is that you signed the dotted line with them. Your part is that you married them. Whatever the case may be, you have a part in that. If we get into this game of gold-plated grit, and again, gold-plated grit is us going through a rough time where we just might have eked our way by, and then we made it through, and then we see someone else going through it, and we tell them it's not a big deal. That's gold-plated grit. When we play that game that Brene Brown talks about, we end up not owning our part in those things that failed. Using, using the words that you might use, not me. If you feel as though something failed, something was a mistake, you're part of that decision. When we don't address those things, then we carry shame. We're afraid of being found out. And that's the biggest problem I found with gold-plated grit. When I coach people, even with my own BS, is that when you don't admit how tough of a time you had or how vulnerable you were at that moment where you were struggling, then you're afraid of being found out. That's where the shame comes from. That's where it gets nerve wracking. That's where you're not sure if you're gonna make it or not. So number one, you really want to be thoughtful about how you view and interpret the things of your past, particularly when they come up with other people. And if you're trying to say, tell someone to get over it, the worst thing you can do is tell them to get over it. Because <laughs> the only thing that can come from that 
is judgment and shame from their part. And the second thing, when you play the game of gold-plated grit, the only thing that can happen is that you end up getting shame about being found out that you actually were struggling. But that's a discussion that you need to have with yourself. The biggest misstep and misunderstanding we have in regards to emotional intelligence is coming from the master, Brene Brown, who specializes in emotional intelligence. And it's actually from her book, Rising Strong. Emotional intelligence, kind of like IQ, EQ is the ability to be empathetic and sympathetic to the environment around you and to emotionally react and respond based on the context. And so it's like yelling at a, at a baby doesn't make much sense because the baby's not gonna understand why you're yelling. Just like you talking to an adult, you have to have that certain conversation based on their emotional state, right? Having the, the, the insight to know how to react and how to express yourself in certain situations based on the context. One of my favorite quotes from her book, Rising Strong. If there's one thing I've learned over the past decade, it's that fear and scarcity immediately trigger comparison. And even pain and hurt are not immune to being assessed and ranked. The refugee in, in Syria doesn't benefit more if you can serve your kindness only for her and withhold it from your neighbor who's going through a divorce. Now, if you caught it in there, she calls this comparative suffering. What a powerful concept. That means that my suffering is different than your suffering, and therefore my suffering deserve more sympathy than yours. Like, wow. But we do that all the time. And there's two things that really happen uh, when we do that, and two reasons why, along with those, why it really sucks. Number one, if, if you wanna be really direct about it, number one, it's not gonna make you feel better. It's just not. You're having a hard time but seeing that I'm having a hard time doesn't doesn't cure your issues, right? So if I'm having a rough time, and let's say that I just lost my job, let's say you're having a rough time and you just lost a loved one, doing the comparison thing and not having sympathy and empathy for myself or for you doesn't help because they're all a loss. They all kind of suck. And so it really has to do not with what you're going through, but how you're actually responding to it. And that in itself might elicit a different level of sympathy and empathy. I often think about the classic example where you'll have uh, two twins. Of course, there's two of them. You'll have twins. <laughs> how many twins are there? There aren't four. So you have twins that experience the same trauma or the same challenges, raised in the same household. And one will be a so-called fruitful member of society and the other one will just be a wreck and have a very difficult time. And they might have the same DNA, especially if they're um, identical twins, they have the same DNA, same energy, look the same, maybe even psychologically seem to be the same, but something will happen and suddenly they'll go in two different directions. It's very, very similar where we might experience the same trauma, the same challenge, but we'll, our outcomes will be completely different. And that's, I think, frankly, based on what lessons we learn from that experience. What survival tactics do we pick up? What weapons, what defenses, whatever terms you wanna use, and I'm using war terms in, on purpose, because when we feel like we're being attacked or having a tough time, then we're gonna grab our defenses, we're gonna grab our own offenses and try to protect ourselves, try to protect our soul, if you wanna get deep about it. The way that we handle that is gonna be completely different. So you and I could go through the same trauma and then need a whole new level of sympathy and empathy just because our reactions and what we what happens when we go through that, how we survive that, if we survive that, is completely different. And so you can't quite scale it out and say your trauma is worse than my trauma because we could be going through the same trauma and it could be completely different. And that's okay. That's kind of part of the process. Number two, it won't help other people feel better. It does nothing for, again, the refugee in Syria if you're having all this long distance sympathy for her, but then you have zero sympathy for your neighbor next door. It's not gonna make them feel better. In fact, in some cases, it could make them feel worse. I remember I was having a, a tough time a little while ago and a longtime friend came by. They were having a tough time and I gave them sympathy for what they were going through, which was kind of similar to what I was going through. And then I told them what I was going through. And they were like, oh my God. And they were like, wow, what you're going through is, 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 is so much worse. And I was like, maybe, but, but we're, we're, we're colleagues in this. Like, 
you're going through your own pain. And you saying that what I'm going through is worse and that I might need more sympathy and more empathy. Thank you, but that doesn't make me feel better. Right, if I was in a different space, it would make me feel worse. But it's like, no, we're both having a hard time. So let's give a hug and both be in this hard time. So I've been on both sides. I've been on the side, like most of us have. I've been on the side where I've looked at, I've had a hard time and I've seen someone else that seems to be having a harder time. And them having a harder time doesn't make me feel necessarily better. And then the other side is true too, where I've been on the side where I've had a really rough time. Someone else has heard about it and they had a less of a rough time and tried to make me feel better saying that I was having a worse time. And I'm like, no, it's all hard and it's all life because it was some life stuff. So that doesn't make other people feel better. So with withholding that, 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 that from yourself doesn't make any sense. There's two big things from that. If you're trying to make other people feel better and doing a comparative suffering and saying your suffering is worse than mine or whatever, two big problems. Number one, you're going to have less empathy for yourself. So if I'm having a tough time, like feeling emotion about it, or whatever, having a hard time getting through it, and I see someone else and I feel like they're having a harder time, then I'm going to have less empathy for myself. I'm going to be like, oh, I can get through this. And so you know, maybe I'll, I won't allow myself to cry. Maybe I won't allow myself to mourn. Whatever the case may be, whatever I need to do, I might limit what I actually end up doing and allowing myself to do because I'm not suffering, in my opinion, as much as they are, so I don't deserve that. So less empathy for ourselves. The second thing, and this is crucial, I talk about that in my book, uh, Bring Your Worth, the predecessor to my new book, Built From Now, is that we, if will be if we think other people are having a tougher time and we don't allow ourselves to, again, grieve, mourn, go through our, you know, the maybe might be a Kubler, Kubler Ross, I'm screwing up her name, bless her, but talks about the four, the five stages of grief. You know, um, Elizabeth Kubler Ross, finally got it. With the, the Kubler Ross thing, as far as the five stages of grief, grief, maybe we don't allow ourselves to go through that. Not only do we rob ourselves of going through that emotional experience and emotions always come up later. So we're not really robbing ourselves. It's just gonna come out in a stronger way later. Keep that in mind. We can't really bury emotions. They always come up later and usually more fierce. But number two, we actually are robbing ourselves of learning. We're not allowing ourselves to learn from that experience. With the challenging times that I've had from um, um, escaping Hurricane Katrina, to other personal things that have happened over the years, allowing myself as much as possible to go through those stages, that's where the learning happens. Again, when I was talking about the tough time I had a few years ago and confiding in my friend who was also having a tough time that was similar, allowing myself that time to cry, to mourn, to grief, to be angry, that's where all those lessons are. That's the stuff I'm sharing with you. If I didn't allow myself if I didn't feel as though that I deserved to feel the way that I felt because other people were having it, in my eyes, seemed to be having a tougher time, then those lessons, those gems that turned into Bring Your Worth, that turned into my new book, um, Built From Now, they wouldn't be in there. I wouldn't have anything to share with you. All I'd say is like, yeah, I had a tough time, but I got through it. But how much did I actually experience it? And I think that's what Brene is getting at. When we get into comparative suffering, we're robbing the other people of actually having their full experience because we're ranking and judging their experience based on our perception. And then and also, as it is with a lot of things, as we judge other people, we're judging ourselves and we're robbing ourselves of that sympathy, robbing ourselves of that empathy and robbing ourselves of that knowledge and that experience when we go through what we go through, right? That's some deep talk for today, but ooh, once you understand comparative suffering, then maybe you can go through your experiences with wider eyes. And if you're more sympathetic and empathetic to yourself, you can't help but be more sympathetic and empathetic to others. So if you're not gonna do it for yourself, do it for other people that you wanna support. If you wanna learn more about emotional intelligence, how to maximize your resources and so on, 
come over over to buildfromnowquiz.com, buildfromnowquiz.com. I promise you I can say it. Talk to I today. It's based on my new book, Build From Now, How to Know Your Power, See Your Abundance, and Nourish the World. I talk about the four resources that we all have, focus, agility, time, and energy. This will actually uh, tell you within a two minute quiz, three to four multiple choice questions, almost a thousand of y'all have taken it. So I love that support. Come through, learn about your biggest resource. And that way you can make the biggest impact on the world. And again, serve that sympathy and empathy to yourself and therefore give it to others because we don't all have the same resources. And so many people that I coach are bumping their heads against the wall because you know they're trying to put you know, a square where, where a circle should be. I wanna help you figure out whatever shape that is. Sorry for the tortured analogy. If you're really digging this program, I can't believe I said digging, I'm not that old. If you're really appreciating this program, be sure to share, like, comment, and most importantly, subscribe. Please subscribe at whatever platform you happen to be at. That gives me good feedback, lets me know that you're, you're really appreciating the program. As you subscribe and share it, then it also gives other people an opportunity to hear what we're talking about. And if there's certain things you want me to tackle or get into, throw them into the comments. Let me know what's going on or drop me a line over at DamonBrown.net. Until next time, remember to keep your emotional intelligence high, that you can always bring your worth, and that you can always build from now. Take care.